All right, so we'll do one more video on directional derivatives, and this is um, just to come back to something we mentioned in class. Uh, it's a final consequence of this theorem here, which is, is thinking about what this is actually telling us. What does the directional derivative tell us, right? And, and, and in particular, uh, what is the significance of the gradient vector? What information is contained in that gradient vector? Um, so, one of the things that we'll note is that the directional derivative is given by the dot product, right? So it's the gradient at a point dotted with the unit vector. And we know from linear algebra, from math 1410, let's say, that I can write the dot product as the gradient of the first, or the, sorry, the magnitude of the first vector, so magnitude of the gradient, times the magnitude of the second vector, but remember u is a unit vector, so the magnitude does not appear, times cosine of the angle between them. Right? So the way you want to think about this is <coughs> you've got, uh, so let's put in, say, a coordinate system. So here's your coordinate system, right? And you're at some point. So here's your point AB. All right. And you want to move in the direction of some vector, let's say U. And you want to know how your function is going to change when you head off in that direction. Okay. Well, the way you maybe should think about it is this, is that through that point, I have a level curve for my function. Maybe it looks something like this, okay? So here is f of x, y equals c, right? Some level curve, and maybe I've got some collection of these level curves, right? There's a bunch of them. Um, but I've in particular got this one level curve there. Well. We've discussed the fact that the gradient is always a normal vector for that level curve. Um, and I think this gives you a sort of an idea of how to understand the directional derivative. Think of the directional derivative as giving you this rate of change. Um, think of this as an elevation map, right, where the, where the spacing between Let's say that you know, each curve represents a, an elevation gain of, of, let's say, 10 meters or something like that, right? So that the, the spacing, you know, the distance between level curves gives you some idea of the steepness, right? And, and if you are at a certain point and you want to move off in some direction, right, and maybe you kind of, let's put in the, you know, so the next level curve is maybe, maybe somewhere like that, right? And, and so you want to know kind of, you know, the rate of change. Well, if you think in terms of elevation maps, you can think, okay, if I go in this direction, well, you know, I'm not moving in the direction of the gradient, and, and the gradient is telling me what? The gradient is sort of telling me the direction in which the function is increasing most rapidly. It's giving this direction of steepest ascent, right? So if, we, if these are, you know, if, if as we go out, we're doing an elevation increase, then, then this is, I don't know, like some kind of crater or something. Here's the bottom of my crater, and I'm climbing my way out. And so following the gradient, well, that might be a bit of a steep climb. So maybe, maybe you kind of have to, you know, well, you don't want to just go along the level because then you're not climbing at all, right? Your elevation is remaining constant. Um, and, of course, we know that the direction, you know, so the tangent to that level is perpendicular to the gradient. That's the whole point of the, you know, thinking of the gradient vector as a normal. It's perpendicular to the levels. But, you know, you want to kind of gradually climb up, do some, you know, maybe some switchbacks or whatever, however you want to think about it, right? Then, then you want to move at some angle to the gradient, right? So you have this angle in here. So here's that, that angle theta fits in there, right? Um, so if you want to make sure that, you know, you're you're climbing up, you've got this elevation gain, right? So say your function is measuring height, 
right? And, and so you don't want to climb too slowly. You don't want to just move along the level and not climb at all. But climbing too rapidly might be overly difficult. So you look for some sort of happy medium, right? So you move it some, some direction that is not perpendicular to the gradient, but also not parallel, because that might be a little bit too steep. Um, so this gives you a nice interpretation of the gradient vector, um, right? It gives, you, it gives you this direction of steepest ascent, right? The direction in which your function is increasing most rapidly. And the magnitude is giving you the, the rate at which you, your function is going to change if you move in that direction, okay? So related to this problem is, is there's, a, there's a mathematical problem which is, is sometimes called, uh, you know, it's either, either known as sort of steepest, steepest ascent or, or descent. Uh, descent. There's an S in there, isn't there? There we go. Um, oh, or this is also known as the gradient flow. Okay. Um, if you search online, if you look for gradient flows online, and this is actually something you might want to, you know, if you have some spare time, do a Google search on gradient flow and see what sorts of things turn up. Um, Gradient flow is a, is a hugely powerful tool in a number of areas of mathematics, from, from functional analysis to geometry um, to uh, some, some of the sort of modern data analysis methods. Um, you will find that gradient flow pops up all over the place, okay? Um, even, even in things like financial mathematics, um, this, is, this is a tool that pops up. Um, the uh, gradient flow or things related to gradient flows was also a tool. Um, there was one of the, you know, these, these mathematical conjectures or theorems that, that if they withstand proof for long enough, they, they gain some popularity and they maybe even make it into the news. Um, several years back, there was the news that, uh, uh, that Perelman had proved the Poincaré conjecture. And um, there was something along the lines of gradient flow that was one of the tools that he was using. Um, for the Poincaré conjecture. Uh, I'm not going to get into the details of explaining what that is about, um, but gradients certainly make an appearance there. Um, so let me give you a quick example, and this is going to be very similar to one that's done in the textbook, and so you can always go back and, and look at the one in the textbook as well. Uh, but uh, the reason we're going to go with this one is that it's, it's going to give me equations that I'm confident I can solve. All right. So let's say that we're... Um, We're on some surface. So I'm going to find the path of steepest, well, let's say descent, descent, and we're going to go along the surface. So let's say uh, z equals, um, let's say, 8 minus x squared minus 2y squared. And we're going to starting at the point, um, oh, let's do 2, 1. Uh, let's see if x is 1. So if x is 2 and y is 1, um, then I guess we're at, well, you know, let's start, let's start a little bit higher. 1, 1, 2. Sorry, no, I'm making a mess of my board. One, one. So if x is one, 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 five. That seems like a good point to start. Okay. So we want a path along the surface, but I'm, I'm actually going to, I'm going to start by working out kind of, I'm going to work things out in the plane, right? So I'm going to, so z, right, z is a function of two variables. So z is a function of, of x and y. So here's my f of x, y, all right? And I'm going to apply this idea here. So we want to think of, you know, think of level curves. In fact, we know what the level curves look like for this thing, right? Um, the level curves for this, uh, they're going to be ellipses. So the idea is that you've got, you've got ellipses. I might be drawing these the wrong way, but it'll illustrate the idea even if my ellipses aren't actually accurate. 
So we've got these ellipses. We're starting, you know, at, at the point, let's say, 1, 1. So somewhere here, here's that point. And what we're going to do is we want to find sort of the steepest path down this hill, right? Um, if, we, if we think of this as a surface, what does this thing look like as a surface? Well, it's, um, it's, a, it's an elliptic paraboloid that's opening downwards. So um, you get a surface that looks something like this, right? Okay. And you're starting, you're starting at some point here on the surface and you're, you're trying to figure out, you know, what's the, what's the fastest way down? That's what we're looking for. Okay. Well, what you want to do here, what you're going to do is, is you're going you're to use this idea of the gradient and that the gradient is giving you sort of the max rate of change. Um, now, if we want steepest descent rather than ascent, we want to, that means we want actually want to go against the gradient. We want to go opposite the gradient. So the gradient vector maybe is, is here, right? And we want to go in the opposite direction because you know, rather than getting sort of maximum increase, we want maximum decrease. So we want theta to be pi, right, 180 degrees. We want to go opposite the gradient. That's going to maximize things. And so if we kind of go against the gradient at every step, we can construct this path, right, where every time, so the idea is that every single time you cross a level curve, you're crossing every level curve at right angles, okay? That's how you're going to get the steepest descent. Uh, so how do, you, how do you guarantee that you're always crossing at right angles? How do you work this out? Well, it looks like this. Let me put these down. So what we're going to do is we're going to let we're going to let r of t equal x of t y of t. Okay. What is, so this is going to be my path. Well, my path in the plane. And then we'll, we'll get the corresponding path on the surface after. So how do I, how do I get steepest descent? Well, um, steepest descent means that I need, I need the following condition. I need to guarantee that r prime, right, the tangent vector to my curve, right, the tangent to my curve, I want that to be opposite the gradient. So I want r prime to be minus, and maybe there's a scalar multiple in here, so maybe we'll say k. Uh, k is going to be positive. Some multiple of the gradient of f. Where? At a point on the curve, given by r of t. So gradient of f at r of t. Okay. So now you put everything in and you think, well, what does this, what does this equation look like? Well, first of all, I know what the gradient looks like. I know that the gradient looks like minus 2x minus 4y, okay? And so what I have here is I have x prime of t, y prime of t equals some minus k times minus 2x minus 4y, all right? And so that means that you need, you need x prime of t to be 2k x of t. You need y prime of t to be 4k y of t. And those are differential equations that you can solve, right? Um, x prime, well, x of t, sorry, x of t is going to be, say, x naught e to the 2kt. y of t is y naught e to the 4kt, right? You can solve those equations. And in fact, you know what x naught and y naught have to be, um, right? You, you can set things so that when t is equal to 0, you're at that point. So we can take x naught to be 1. We can take y naught to be 1. Um, 
And, and by the way, e to the 4 kt is just the square of e to the 2 kt. Um, so really what this is saying is that y should equal x squared, right? So, so this, this curve here is it's part of a parabola, okay? That's the curve that you need to take if you want to be perpendicular to each of those level curves as you make your way down. Okay. Um, finally, if you wanted actually the path on the surface, how do you do that? Well, once you have x and y, you know how to get z, right? So z of t would be 8 minus x of t squared minus 2 times y of t squared. You can plug that in. Now you know what z looks like, um, and you can compute that path.